This presentation has been developed as an educational aid to understanding the diagnosis, consequences, and treatment options for sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is increasingly recognized in our population, occurring with a frequency of 4 to 9 percent in the middle-aged adult population. Sleep apnea becomes more prevalent with obesity, as women go through menopause, and with aging in general. Sleep apnea essentially means that the person is not breathing properly at night. During the daytime, breathing is completely normal. But at night, typically because of what we term obstruction or obstructive sleep apnea, the upper air passage narrows and collapses, causing pauses in the breathing. Although each individual pause is not significant, accumulation of events over the entire night can have substantial consequence. We all stop breathing to some degree during the night and when this occurs less than five times per hour we consider this normal. When we stop breathing from five to fifteen times an hour we consider this as mild sleep apnea. Moderate sleep apnea is defined as pauses occurring from 15 to 29 times an hour and severe sleep apnea from 30 or more times per hour. Sleep apnea has different consequences of which there are three of primary concern. Most important are the cardiovascular risks associated with untreated sleep apnea. These include a higher risk of hypertension, stroke, heart attack, and congestive heart failure. As well, sleep apnea does cause disruption of sleep at night through each individual pause in breathing. This results in a non-restorative, fragmented sleep, causing fatigue and tiredness, as well as sleepiness during the daytime. Both the cardiovascular and the daytime symptoms can be improved with therapy. The third consequence to sleep apnea is that of snoring, which is commonly associated with the disorder and which disrupts the bed partner's sleep at night, resulting in non-restorative sleep and tiredness. Sleep apnea is a treatable entity. It is noteworthy that medications are an ineffective form of therapy for this disorder. Nasal strips and decongestants, although sometimes helpful for patients who suffer from snoring without sleep apnea, are generally not considered effective treatment for this disorder. It is important to be aware that sedatives, alcohol, particularly close to bedtime, and cigarette consumption can all worsen sleep apnea and these should be avoided if possible. Positional therapy can sometimes be a useful form of treatment for this disorder. In some patients, the sleep apnea is worse when they lie on their back, and avoidance of a position where they're lying on their back can be a useful treatment. This can be accomplished by sewing a tennis ball in the back of a pajama or t-shirt to allow the patient to avoid sleeping in a supine position. Weight reduction can commonly be helpful in patients when they are obese. This is an ultimate goal for many patients with sleep apnea and in some cases it can be curative if the weight can be lost and maintained in a normal range over a long period of time. In more moderate to severe sleep apnea we look at other definitive forms of therapy of which there are three primary to discuss. Surgery on the upper air passage, dental device therapy, and nasal CPAP. In obstructive sleep apnea, the upper airway becomes blocked during sleep when the base of the tongue falls back and the adjacent tissues collapse, causing a mechanical obstruction of the upper airway. Surgery of the upper air passage commonly involves removal of the tissues of the soft palate and tonsillar region, either through general anesthesia or while awake, 
with a laser-assisted procedure, radiofrequency therapy, or palatal implants. Surgery is best suited for patients with mild sleep apnea. However, it should be remembered that the success rate for surgery, even in the best of hands, is only 50%. As well, it is not uncommon that years later, snoring and sleep apnea may recur. Dental device therapy can be an effective treatment for mild to moderate sleep apnea. The device involves wearing an appliance at night different from the type of appliance worn by patients who grind their teeth. This device protrudes the jaw forward and by doing so moves the tongue forward, widening and preventing collapse of the upper air passage. Dental device therapy is effective in approximately 70% of cases. This treatment is not paid for by the Ministry of Health, but may be partially covered by a private dental plan. Nasal CPAP is currently the treatment of choice for most patients with sleep apnea and is the only recommended therapy for patients with severe disease. CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure and essentially involves using a constant air pressure delivered to the upper air passage to prevent collapse and keep the air passage open while sleeping. In contrast to other treatments discussed, CPAP is effective in treating almost all patients with sleep apnea and is the only therapy that has been proven to prevent the previously described consequences of sleep apnea. It is important to remember that when starting treatment, it will take a few weeks to as long as two months to adjust to therapy. So patients choosing this form of therapy must be patient while starting treatment to allow themselves to acclimatize. Although there are a number of CPAP devices available, they are all almost equivalently effective. The nasal interface is the most important individual component to focus on when obtaining CPAP. It should fit comfortably and should not leak. If this can be achieved, the experience of using CPAP will be much more positive. It is also important to remember that CPAP is a treatment and not a cure. Thus, it must be worn on a nightly basis and not intermittently. The Ministry of Health does supplement part of the cost of obtaining CPAP therapy. Private insurance commonly provides coverage for the residual costs. This brings our presentation to a close. I hope you have found this presentation informative and will allow you to formulate questions to ask your sleep specialist when you see him shortly in consultation. Thank you for your time.